and happy Earth Day, everyone. Okay, so uh, for uh, before we get started, I just want to advise any attendees under the under the age of thirteen that they are, that they should have an, a supervised they should be supervised by a parent or guardian, and uh, just want to know that every, all everyone in attendance so that we are recording this um, meeting. Most people should be settled in by now. So without any further ado. I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Linda McCarthy. So Dr. McCarthy is a, lake, a Great Lakes ecologist, uh, ecotoxicologist, sorry. She studies pollutants and other stresses on, the, uh, on aquatic and terrestrial organisms around the Great Lakes. Uh, she got a PhD from the University of Waterloo and has worked for years for the De Department of Fisheries and Oceans at the Canada Center for Inland Waters in Burlington, Ontario. She's currently a professor of biology at Ryerson and she's also a f uh, one of the founders, or the founder, sorry, of the Ryerson Urban Water. So I would like everyone to help me in welcoming Dr. Linda McCarthy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here, uh, Adisha. This is not obviously quite uh, the way I normally lecture, and um, but let us see how this goes along. So first of all, for everyone who is uh, listening, um, happy Earth Day. Um, I often wonder what the word happy means with regards to Earth Day, but I'm going to suggest that we are going to be incredibly successful in helping uh, spaceship Earth go forward. So, but on April 22nd, 2020, today, it's been half a century since the first Earth Day was founded, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, if you are all sitting in my uh, lecture hall, particularly if I was teaching you ecotoxicology, the first thing I would ask you is to shout out the names of these Great Lakes, and I know that you're shouting it out wherever you are right now, but I'm gonna know that you just said that this body of water here is Lake Ontario. We have Toronto here and Hamilton here. We come down the Niagara River. This of course is Lake Erie. I'll be spending a little bit of time talking about Lake Erie because when I very briefly go over the pollution that was happening in the 1950s and 60s to the Great Lakes, Lake Erie ended up being our canary in the coal mine. That is, we were able to very, very easily insult Lake Erie, but thank heavens we were able to also save it as well. And we'll be looking at issues that Lake Erie has today. We come up the Detroit River to Lake St. Clair, up the St. Clair River to Lake Huron. I know you're yelling out to me now that this is Georgian Bay. Manitoulin Island right here is the largest inland island in the world. We pop to Lake Michigan. Chicago, Illinois is right here. Any Green Bay's Packers fans, this is Green Bay. And probably one of my favorite of all lakes is Lake Superior. <clears throat> now, I want to also just uh, super briefly go over Canada's uh, geography itself. It's always actually more of a reminder to me than anybody else who's listening. It's a reminder to me that it is a huge country at 10 million square kilometers. I'm not even actually sure what that means, huge. And it's noted as the second largest country in the world in total area, including its water. It tells you how much surface wa fresh water Canada has, that if you just included the land area only, it's the fourth largest country in the world. And in fact, it contains three of the world's top 20 largest lakes that are totally in Canada. I, of course, would be asking of you uh, in my lecture, but and you're shouting out right now, Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories, Great Slave Lake also in the Northwest Territories, and a lake that is actually shallow, but has a huge surface area, Lake Winnipeg. I would also like to point out, but it's again to remind myself, we have the largest international border in the world with another country, and of course that's the US, at almost 9,000 kilometers. And it's incredibly important to keep this in mind because we share most of the Great Lakes with this international partner. And so our relationships over the centuries 
have been so incredibly critical. So just honing in then, so if we take a look at the Great Lakes and we hone in on them, again, they are nearly 20% of the world's fresh water volume. That's huge. And so even just from that point of view, well worth looking after them. And four of the lakes, all right, are binational, i.e. four lakes we share with America. Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Superior. Now, Lake Michigan is totally in America, but as it flows into Lake Huron and Huron out to Lake Erie, Lake Ontario and out to the Atlantic Ocean, it is totally not only hydrologically connected to the other Great Lakes, but is important for us as well. I also just want to point out eight U.S. states border the Great Lakes and two provinces, Ontario and Quebec something absolutely to keep in mind when we talk about the relationships that humans must always strongly have forged in entrusted friendships going forwards. One of my biggest problems with teaching my students about the Great Lakes is that unless you scuba dive and go down through the water column, it's so difficult as you look out over the Great Lakes and down into the water to see what is there, but I need you, I need to assure you, the diversity is incredible. Starting with, of course, our fish, and we have the smallmouth bass, and of course, a beautiful member of the salmonid family. This is a male rainbow trout. You can always tell by its incredible coloring. These are top piscivores. They're at the top of the food chain. They're carnivores. They eat other fish, but my particular favorite is this very lonely and shy fish. This is a Great Lakes sturgeon. Now it was around 70 million years ago before Tyrannosaurus rex walked the land. So it is truly an ancient and noble fish. We have almost fished it to extinction, of course, but there's huge conservancy efforts to bring it back. You will see from where its mouth is positioned it is actually a vacuum cleaner. It goes along the bottom of the lakes and it actually vacuums up sediment. It is not a top carnivore by any stretch, unlike the rainbow trout, for example. And then, of course, some of the other biodiversity are the primary producers. Uh, these are phytoplankton or single-celled algae, the dinoflagellates, the green algae, the diatoms. And you will have already taken in science that these primary producers at the base of any food chain convert sunlight into food via photosynthesis. All right. And what's so important about these organisms on many, many levels, but in light of climate change issues, they often take inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide, sequester it and make it into organic carbon carbohydrates as food and so we'll see these as a scrubber of atmospheric carbon dioxide incredibly important all right so they're at the base of the food web and then next in the aquatic environment we have primary consumers the zooplankton such as hyalella or daphnia and they consume these primary producers in what is actually a wonderful food web when no insults are going in, generally from humankind, to impact that food web. So as you can see then, we have along the base trophic level, the primary producers, then the primary consumers, the zooplankton, then we have um, fish, herbivores, and zooplanktivores, and then we have the top piscivores, as I mentioned. Now in this Lake Erie food web, I just wanted to show you a little bit of the complexity. This is not all of the organisms you can imagine, but one of the areas of concern I'm gonna talk about are invasive species. So this zebra mussel, for example, that's an invasive, it actually can really destroy a lot of the food web and cause a collapse. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just going back through a little bit of Great Lakes history, in the 1950s and 60s, and we had just finished the Second World War, manufacturing and prosperity had come to North America and had come to the Great Lakes. 
But with that massive human prosperity and success came this terrible urban and rural pollution. Now at the time, there weren't many people who understood what a problem this pollution was, whether it was untreated wastewater going into the Great Lakes and to rivers, for example, or massive air pollution, all right? But what was starting to be seen before too long, and certainly by the 1960s, and Lake Erie, which I mentioned was our canary in the coal mine at the time, because of nutrient runoff from farmers' fields, and sewage coming in from human beings going into Lake Erie, we were starting to see massive algal blooms. Not only was this causing terrible deleterious water, but when the algae dies and is degraded by bacteria, it takes oxygen out of the water and we were having massive fish kills. What else was becoming well known around the Great Lakes were invasive species such as the lamprey eel, now the lamp, which is an ancient jawless fish from Europe and Asia, but when it made its way into the lower Great Lakes, it had no predators to just help to keep its numbers low, and it started to destroy Great Lakes fish such as lake trout. And these lamprey eel are incredibly successful parasites. They would ratchet on to the sides of these fish with this buccal cavity and then proceed then to suck the liquids out of the fish, killing them. It really was a terrible and egregious sight. Uh, by the 1950s and 1960s, anglers, fishermen, and women who uh, catch fish started reporting the fish tumors that they were starting to see on the outsides of the fish they were catching. And when they were cutting open the fish uh, to eat the fillets, they were noticing internal tumors. And birders or bird watchers were starting to report reproductive abnormalities in fish eating birds such as this cormorant. Now what they were noticing with these cormorants when the cormorants were hatching, the babies came out with these crossed bills, which was very unnatural. It was also stopping them from eating, so these hatchlings would starve to death. So this is what anglers and birders were starting to report. And I just wanna mention here, these people were some of our first citizen scientists, citizens who were making observations about the world about them and reporting it to scientists. Now, it eventually turned out that the causes of these tumors and these abnormalities were from the insecticide DDT and manufactured products such as PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls. Myrex was a noted pesticide, and we were using mercury and lead for a whole variety of uses. Lead was certainly in drinking water pipes. So what we then see are in, in, in all of the Western world, but it really came to light in the Great Lakes and in North America, were all of these egregious insults to the organisms living on the land and the water. And you started to have people saying, enough is enough. And so scientists such as Rachel Carson started to really educate the citizens in communities. And Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. And it is totally a review of all the scientific knowledge that was noted at the time of contaminants insulting animals. But it was so well written, citizens could actually read it, understand it, and we started to see the rise of vocal citizen scientists. And together they all started the environmental movement. Well, as we go through the 1960s, more and more people became concerned about Spaceship Earth and that it was being terribly polluted. And on April 22nd, 1970, exactly half a century ago today, the first Earth Day was started in the United States. And I just want to point out, the co-organizers at the time were Gaylord Nelson, who was a Democrat, and Pete McCloskey, who was a Republican. And this idea of everybody being able to come together for a common cause, really, really important. 
The first Earth Day poster was, we have met the enemy and he is us. This was really important because it was saying, we humans are at fault. And at acknowledging responsibility, we could also say, and we can all come together to be part of the solution as well. So the voting public continued their education with Silent Spring coming together with Earth Day. And in 1970, Dr. Zeus wrote and then published a year later, The Lorax. And this became really important for parents who read it to their young children. And I will just very, very briefly read to you near the end. But now, said the Onceler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And so as time went on, pollution issues, uh, some of them started to get better and to be clear, cleaned up. So as we go through the 1970s and the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, there were solutions, but some things got worse. And so by the time we come to the 1920 or the late 20 teens, and we start to just look at Great Lakes issues, what we start to see is an incredibly prolific rise in urban communities. And with urban communities came impermeable hardscape. So we no longer had open soil that could actually filter rainwater, for example. And we'll go into that a little bit more. But in order for this urban community to be built, it required that wetlands that have always been on the coastlines of lakes and ponds and oceans, it was required that they be removed. But in removing these wetlands, we removed a filtration system and we'll talk a little bit briefly about that idea in just a second, but lack of filtration of runoff pollutants. And these wetlands are the most diverse biome in the world, and they, in fact, are a huge source of aquatic nurseries. It is within these wetlands that little larval fish grow and survive before going out into the big open lakes. It is here then that we have tadpoles, and of course our primary producers and primary consumers. We have um, reptiles, of course, making their home here and coming out on land. We have all kinds of bird populations, part of that wetland biome. When they get destroyed to put in um, urban uh, impermeable hardscape, something really gets lost to that habitat. We continue to see the invasion of exotic species. There's now 185 species in the Great Lakes basins that are invaders. Certainly the zebra mussels brought in in the mid 1980s are still some of the most egregious, but by far our biggest threat is the Asian carp. The Asian carp is not in the Great Lakes yet, but scientists think that it will not be long before they come. They are prodigious consumers of everything that they come into contact with. And there's a big fear that when Asian carp get into the Great Lakes, the entire food web will actually totally collapse. These huge algal blooms that we hoped that we had cleaned up in the 1960s and 1970s by putting in stricter sewage treatment controls, they became huge again because we never did figure out how to stop fertilizers running off the land into the water, causing these huge algal blooms. And today again in Lake Erie, they are causing unsafe drinking water. This is a picture from 18 months ago in Lake Erie. You can see the massive algal blooms. And then by far tying this all up is of course global warming and climate change. One of the major um, observations that we see in the urban, urban environment with regards to climate change are extreme weather events. So these photos then are from July 2013 when more rain fell, I think in 24 hours than had fallen since Hurricane Hazel of 1954. And we had massive and actually dangerous flash floods. 
And this was due to impermeable hardscape and lack of any strategies to capture that rainfall. And it really came home to roost that our urban landscape was incredibly unresilient and very unsustainable for the climate change issues that were coming forward. And this is Union Station back in July 2013. Some of these pictures boggle my brain. I was actually in downtown Toronto at the time. I was terribly afraid my car was actually going to get swept away. So what I have been involved in for the last several years is with a whole bunch of other expertise around the table, trying to develop a healthy urban water cycle that's in lockstep with climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. So if we look at an urban environment such as Toronto that is unhealthy and unsustainable, what are we looking at? We're looking at all kinds of roads and asphalt that has spills on it uh, going into receiving bodies of water. We still have agricultural runoff and the excessive nutrients going in and maybe pesticides. We take a look then at a hardscape that's very unyielding, unpermeable, all right? And we have industrial wastewater. It can be treated to a certain amount and then is going back into source waters as well. Now, what does this mean? What it means is say a Lake Ontario, for example, that is in unclean water for irrigation, unclean water for industry, we need clean waters for these strategies. Unclean source water, unclean drinking water that has to be cleaned for citizens to drink. Unstable and degraded fisheries, the fish are still um, full of contaminants that have run off the land. And it would be hard pressed to find humans who want to actually swim in Toronto Harbor, for example, and that's such a shame. This leads to unsustainable tourism. So what I'm involved in then is how do we develop innovative technologies to develop a healthy and resilient urban environment? And with these technologies, help with policy changes to bring around these resilient strategies and probably by far a comprehensive education of everybody uh, in uh, the community. And this is from the classroom to the boardroom to the legislature. And so what we can do, if we put wetlands all the way around along roads and along rivers, we can then filter and capture contaminants. We can filter and capture agricultural runoff. We can look after our urban forests. We can put green roofs on all of our buildings. We can make our pavement porous so the water goes through and is filtered. And what we think, what we know we can have happen, clean source water for drinking, for industry, for agriculture, a fisheries that we can use and who is healthy, and of course, the sustainable tourism. So these strategies are all within our grasp. They've been used many places in the world and we just have to bring them together. And many experts are, but what I want to do is I just want to go over a few rights now that can be implemented in many, many areas. So one of the huge areas is rainwater harvesting, rainwater capture. And many of you, I know your teachers, your parents, everyone around you, yourselves, you've already started looking at how to harvest rainfall. Even if it's about downspout capture and cisterns, even at your schools. But if you think about your houses, you can put these in too. What's really, really cool is that if there's enough rain and we can capture it, we can keep it in tanks and we can pump it back into schools. We can pump it back into industrial buildings, into your homes. And we can use it in your homes, for example, to wash your laundry. Rainwater is perfect for that. Or we can flush toilets uh, in lavatory plumbing, okay? If we take a look then at any ponds anywhere, whether it's in your backyards, whether it's stormwater ponds in residential areas, 
whether it's little ponds around your school that you can help to build. These ponds, these depressions, they capture rainwater, and if the rainwater stays in there, you'll soon start to see macrophytes or water plants. You start to see then larval, but larval amphibians, my zooplankton, my primary consumers, and all kinds of primary producers, and you will see birds. And this is the same then for the stormwater ponds. Now, the stormwater ponds were built to grab rainfall and slow the release of that rainfall to lakes, so to stop flooding. But as you can see from all of these wetland plants, these macrophytes, we also can scrub carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to use photosynthetically to make carbohydrates. We already discussed that. And we can biofilter pollutants coming off of the roads and driveways, et cetera. Street trees and urban forests. You know, it's really quite funny. Any of you who come from the rural environment or in northern places with tons of forests, street trees don't look very important, but they really, really are. And you take a look at this photo of Toronto. Toronto has a huge ravine forest system but it must be protected by us. So what is really cool about these street trees, they actually can form a hydrological cycle, a very localized one. So the tree canopy can capture and retain water. We have water infiltration down to the roots. The roots grab that rainwater, bring it back up through the trees, envirotranspiration, and what we have then is this cycle, which is incredible. And it also helps to cool cities, which are heat islands. And again, they're able to take this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and sequester it for carbon dioxide, uh, for carbohydrates and sugar source. What else are there and well worth getting involved in? These rain gardens that we see in some of this busiest intersections in urban environments, these rain gardens, engineers, of course, call them bioretention facilities. They look very, very simple on the surface. In fact, sometimes people totally don't even notice them. But if you take a look down below at what they really are, they're native plants, all right? They have soil that's prepared with all kinds of microorganisms, all right? And they have all kinds of filtration systems. And this is why they're so important. When we have rainfall and rainfall falls onto this urban hardscape, all right? There is a huge amount of pollution in roofs, in driveways, in parking lots, on streets. If we can take that polluted stormwater have it go into these rain gardens where it can be filtered and treated and turned back into much cleaner water and capture the rainwater to reduce urban flooding, then we've done something really incredible. And don't forget, plants sequester carbon dioxide. So these are so incredibly important for climate change uh, mitigation strategies. Green roofs. What's really cool about Toronto, but Chicago and Buffalo and Cleveland and Hamilton, all kinds of cities around the Great Lakes, is that many of the buildings now have green roofs. Now, the green roofs are there to capture water during rainfall, sequester carbon dioxide. But if you take a look, this is the top of the George Vary Engineering and Computer Building at Ryerson. This is Ryerson Urban Farm, and it is a student-run initiative. If you peek over the side, it's four stories down to the road below, okay? So this is quite high up. This student-run initiative produces 3,600 kilograms of fresh, organic, local produce every year, and it goes to our campus kitchens, and the Ryerson Farmers Market once a week sells this produce, these crops go to community food banks. It's unbelievable. And because many tours are given to schools and other members of the community, 
the broader community gains a deeper understanding of urban agriculture. So that's green roofs. And so then, when we have a greater knowledge then of anything, we can start to implement them around us. And urban gardens, they've always been really important. They're gonna become even more important in North American cities such as Toronto. Absolutely important for food consumption, but they can help restore nature in the in, uh, urban environment, which was once a wasted industrial uh, wasteland, all right? We can bring farming traditions that once were just part of the rural landscape into urban cities. We can help educate urban dwellers into the incredible importance of agriculture. And for all the eco schools in Toronto, and let me tell you, a huge call out to all teachers out there who have done so much to help their students care about the environment, what many schools have been able to do is find small plots, tiny little allotments on their school grounds and students then have helped to grow crops, which is absolutely amazing. Permeable hardscapes, all right. Again, getting away from hardscapes, roads and your school parking lot that doesn't allow infiltration and actually putting in school parking lots with permeable hardscapes so that we can capture water, we can retain the water, we can filter it is really important. So all of these two photos here then are wonderful photos of permeable hardscapes. And like the um, rain gardens that I just went over before, you'll see that it's a really neat engineered system, all right, of filtration, bedrock, and then soil that actually helps to clean and capture any water flowing down. Now you ask, why can't we just have rain gardens everywhere? Well, that is simply not a good solution. We still need to drive on roads. We can't drive on gardens. But if we can start to have parking lots that are made of permeable hardscapes such as this and roads and driveways, then um, we'll go a long way into water capture and water conservation. And then another huge one that has really taken off is this whole idea of pollinator gardens. Now we know that our pollinators, our, our bees and bees and all of our insects and our bats and all pollinators are going through a terrible decline. Now we know that they're so instrumental for crop production. And so we absolutely have to help bring them back. And so these butterfly bee pollinator uh, gardens and, and, and habitats, we can put them anywhere. But I just want to call out one plant and one pollinator, and that's milkweeds, and that's the monarch butterfly. And about a decade ago, monarch butterflies were on a precipitous decline, and a whole bunch of scientists and teachers and caring parents and caring students started planting milkweeds. And what we have seen is that the monarch butterfly, who depends on the milkweed for their life cycle, have started to come back. So something that straightforward. So I will bring us back to citizen scientists. And I started out by talking about Great Lakes water pollution and how it was citizen scientists, the fishermen, the bird watchers, naturalists and conservationists, who traditionally made the observations, told the scientists, and some solutions came about. Well, today it's unbelievable. Not only is it older human beings that are citizen scientists, it is so many members of the general public, starting with uh, grade schools, oh my gosh, even kindergarten preschoolers, all the way through high school and what we're and, and universities and colleges. And what we're seeing is this unprecedented collaboration between professionals and all these members of the general public, these citizen scientists, who are really helping to move solutions forward. So the citizen scientists then, they're, volunteer, uh, they're volunteers and they make their observations, they generate data, put them onto apps, 
and those apps go to scientific institutions who can use them. So one scientific institution that I really adore is iNaturalist. It is out of the California Academy of Sciences, an institution that has a huge amount of experts, right? And they record living organisms. So what they ask schools, for example, to do is to go out, make observations of the organisms they see out there, download them to apps, and then those observations are sent to scientific data banks, such as the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And this helps scientists, all of these observations dumped into apps, really helps scientists come up with solutions. And I love these two photos. These, these are not the same uh, group of students, but they're both grade threes, which is interesting. So this teacher has taken their grade three students out, has told them what birds to look for in the trees. So the students are educated as to what the birds will look like, and then they make their observations, put them into the apps, and it's sent then to a scientific institution. In this case, a teacher has taken their students to uh, a local um, stormwater pond around the school, and the students are looking at, well, the macrophytes, of course, the wetland plants, but also they're looking at primary producers and consumers in the water, they're counting larval tadpoles, for example, and it's just unbelievable. So, you know, how, how can we all get involved? I mean, it, it, it really is cool what we can do. So Con Conservation Halton has a huge strategy called Trees for Watershed Health, and they just get community people out to plant a tree. Now, the Nature Conservancy, I'm just going to give a huge call out to, they were started in 1951, so they're a huge conservancy. They have a huge strategy. If we can plant a billion trees on Spaceship Earth, we will sure have helped the planet. And their motto is, one billion begins with just one. So let me just finish off by saying, and now says the Onceler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And so, exactly half a century ago, a ton of very caring citizens got together and started the first Earth Day. And many solutions were implemented, but as you know, a lot of problems remain. And I just know today, on this Earth Day, April 22nd, 2020, we all can make a huge positive difference, even by our smallest actions. So thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. I just can't wait to go out and plant a milkweed. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. McCarthy. This was, was amazing. Uh, and, and like you said, uh, one billion begins with one. One. Okay. That's all. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so what we'll do right now, if it's okay with you, I'll ask you a few questions I received from uh, some of the audience members beforehand. And anyone who has any questions to ask, please feel free to do so uh, by answering it into the chat. We'll try our best to get to as many of the questions as possible. But unfortunately, if we're not able to, if we're unable to, you can always like, we, we will take a record of these questions and try to get them to you with, with, in our next newsletter. Okay, so are you ready, uh, Dr. McCarthy? You betcha. Okay, so the first question is, why is plant biology important in our world today? How can we use, how can we use it to both benefit us and our planet? So in, in essence, they're asking why a tree is important. <laughs> absolutely, and absolutely a spectacular question. And uh, Adisa, I'm just gonna remind myself, it's not just the trees, it's those macrophytes in those ponds next to the school. It's the primary producers, you know, the, those algae that we went over as well. So uh, trees, plants, all of them are primary producers. So why are all of them so important? Well, let me start at the most basic, and that is, of course, they produce all of our food. They convert sunlight into carbohydrates. So at the very base level, they take sunlight and inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide produce food. Absolutely, we've, we've gone over that. 
So at a bigger um, planetary scale, they'll help to scrub carbon dioxide out of the environment as well with regards to climate change mitigation efforts. But I want to actually go into something else that for me, plants are so important, not only for medicines, absolutely, but there is something that many, many humans over centuries and centuries have known, and it's something that's weirdly called forest bathing. And we know that if we go into a forest, say the Don River Ravine, all right, just for a little walk, what happens to us is we start to calm down. We're not as anxious. We get to breathe in oxygen. Something happens to us as far as mental well-being that I think it's just one of the most incredible things that plants does. And I have a little pot outside, and I know it's snowing right now, but my little seed is pushing itself up through the soil. And I can't tell you, as I watch that little seed grow, something inside of me just starts to feel happier. So if I'm angry about everything in the world, and I'm usually yelling at somebody with the isolation and everything, just watching a little tiny seed break through that seed pod is everything. Does that answer that question? Wow. Yeah, that, 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 that was perfect, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I feel like I should try to go outside and take a walk myself. <laughs> Okay, so let me see if we have another question here. So, uh, so the question is uh, from one of our audience members who has a project that got canceled. It's about seed bombs. Uh, can you tell us a bit about seed bombs? Yeah, so seed bombs is, is real fun, and I and I swear it came about. It, well, I know it came about through teachers who uh, wanted to somehow take barren, uh, you know playing fields around them and maybe see if they can get their students to grow wildflowers and stuff. But also conservationists came up with this as well. And this whole idea of, you know, taking a ball of soil, maybe mixed with clay, putting, you know, native plant seeds or freshwater seeds and, and just kind of lobbing them at any sort of area that looks like you could do with some plants. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, Adisa, that having looked into this, I would love them to be called seed baseballs okay. rather than seed bombs but I'm just saying you can tell I miss being out and watching yeah. a you know a baseball game yeah. but uh, yeah just something that straightforward and again I'm really just calling out to the teachers who have been teaching students just to do something this straightforward for decades Nice. I like that seed baseballs. I, I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a lot more fun, yeah? <laughs> okay, so next question. So it, this student wants to know, it's like over time, would any of the pollutants on Earth seep into outer space and pollute other parts of the solar system? Oh, that's such a, a great question. So Sadly, not being an astrophysicist, uh, <laughs> I sure wish I, I was, nor a climatologist. Um, I will say that I know there's about four uh, layers of atmosphere surrounding the Earth, including the stratosphere and troposphere. And um, with regards to atmospheric pollutants, um, the farthest we've got is just through two layers, one being CFCs in the 70s and 80s that caused a hole in the ozone. Um, but with regards to atmospheric pollution going into outer space, no. But what I do want to say is that there's a lot of space junk um, in outer space. Now, we do have to send satellites and other uh, technological waste uh, has to get through Earth's atmosphere. But once it's gotten through the space, Earth's atmosphere, there's actually a lot of garbage out there. And... I don't know enough about the subject area, but I am going to suggest that some atmospheric uh, climatologists are concerned. Okay. So that's just a little uh, something the, the, the audience members can go look up a bit on, on space. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow, it's very interesting. Okay, so now we have a question that isn't specifically related to the environment, but it's very relevant to today. So. This question is, is, how do scientists and other professional researchers cope during the corona epidemic? Okay. 
one thing they learn is how to Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, <laughs> in particular their students. I mean, we can always connect uh, with each other, with our colleagues, but for a scientist such as myself, um, it is way more important for me to connect with my students, undergrad and graduate students as well. Um, and it is going to have to be uh, electronically. Um, it's a really, really tough one. What I do need to say though is, and I'm in constant connection with my colleagues, mm -hmm. we've started in slowing down from our rush, rush, everyday stuff. We've actually started thinking way more deeply in connecting with a whole lot of citizens how do we help save Spaceship Earth? And so that's probably been the biggest bonus, which you can call that, <laughs> of home isolation, yeah. is that it has forced us to start paying attention to the important stuff. And, and I have to say, many of my colleagues and I have found that the consumer society that we just lived through for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. we didn't need most of the stuff we bought True. and so yeah that's how we're coping how to make a better gentler slower world and i know that that does not help for many many people i know many people in industry uh who are at home uh with no jobs i absolutely know so many frontline workers whether it's cashiers or personal support workers in old age homes and it's really, really, really tough for everyone. We will come out of this, and then we'll get it over. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well said, well said. <laughs> so, in 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 keeping with that, with that uh, theme about how we adapted in terms of the the pandemic, have have there been any observations of any sort of like uh, how should I say, reduction in our pollutants or anything over this time period? So, Adisha, I watch way too much news, okay. and one of, one of the things I focus on is human kindness. Um, so much of the, of the media has reported on human kindness, and that has just given me such courage to go for it. But then we have environmental scientists reporting that air pollution has started to disappear from many parts of the world because, of course, you know, vehicles are no longer emitting and industry is not emitting. I mean, there are cases, I think, of dolphins and uh, the Canal of Venice. I certainly saw some photography that I could see down through the canals in the bottom. And I saw fish in there that never been see, you know, we were not able to see before. I just read that there are whales going back into the Mediterranean Sea. So it is unbelievable for environmental scientists like myself to take a look at humans sadly who have had to be stopped dead in their tracks and we don't know what that means economically but that the earth has been able to recover remarkably quickly and so what the pandemic when when we come through it on the other side and we will if we can remember when everybody jobs that are sustainable that we can actually come up with solutions to help when climate change is our huge issue that'd be really helpful oh, indeed <laughs> indeed so let me just take a look through the chat here a bit more uh so, so one of these questions is asking are there any benefits from invasive species oh that is such a great question. <laughs> oh, that is such a great question. And I never have any judgments on any biological system. So I don't call them evil, unlike some of my other <laughs> uh, colleagues. Um, I, I guess by definition, we call something invasive if they have out-competed the native species to such an extent that they've been responsible for lack of biodiversity or food web decline. Okay. So from a human point of view, and this is what's really interesting, the Asian carp 
which is the biggest concern we have for the Great Lakes, was brought into the lower United States and farm fished as a food source, as a major protein source for humans. And so what is one person's food source is another person's invasive. And so I just think by definition, if an invasive has destroyed biodiversity in an area, then I'm not sure I see benefit. Interesting. I'm not sure if that helps at all, Adisa. Yeah, that, that was actually a very, very, very nice answer. Like, uh, so let, let's, let's, let's keep on the, on the Asian curve for a bit. So uh, are there any plans, because you mentioned like we were, we're trying to keep our eyes out for them currently, trying to prevent them from entering into the Great Lakes, right? Do you know of any plans or any strategies that, that we're actively using to try to prevent them? Is it the physical barriers or anything? Yeah, so it is well known that they've made their way from the fish farms of Louisiana, all right, and made their way up the mighty Mississippi River, so you can imagine how powerful these fish are. And they've made their way over to the Great Lakes watershed that they normally shouldn't have been able to, because in the 1900s, Chicago diverted the Chicago River away from emptying into Lake Michigan over to the Mississippi watershed. So it is known that the Asian carp will make their way up the Mississippi River, has gotten into that Chicago diversion, and is very, very close to getting into Lake Michigan. We uh, uh, fishery scientists in the area are really hoping that some of the DNA they've detected is not there already. What are some of the barriers? Certainly physical barriers, certainly electric barriers, but it really needs citizens to put a huge amount of effort into getting their political leaders into those barriers in place. Okay. So, so, so you're, it, it's, it's a massive collective effort on all of our parts. On all of our parts. Okay. But, but Adisa, let it's me not. just say first though, if you're not educated in these issues, if you don't even know about them, mm -hmm. then you can't help. And so one of the forums such as this one, which just such a call out to you, is the more that the citizenry gets educated, the more they can make informed choices. Okay, perfect. So we'll keep doing activities such as this one. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's just take a side step away from fish and talk about plants just a little bit. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, so there's a question here asking about how do you how do you park in a plant parking lot without killing the plants? So how, how could we design them in a way where we don't destroy the plants that we, we put there? Absolutely. So uh, when I uh, showed the rain gardens, but I also showed you the permeable pavement, all right? It actually is really easy to have permeable pavement. You can park your cars, all right? Um, but it is engineered to be solid enough to hold parts of structures and yet infiltrates rainwater. And then beside all of these parking lots, and I'm even thinking of schools, for example, you can then have these rain gardens. So they absolutely coexist adjacent to each other. Okay. So, so proper engineering is, is proper, what is necessary. Proper engineering, absolutely. Okay. Yes, so now staying with the topic of plants, I uh, have a few questions here about, about how do you say cacti, cactuses? I'm not sure what, what the pluralization is exactly, but what is the benefit of, of plants such as those, those desert plants where we know don't really have what we think of as leaves? Do they help in the sequestering carbon or defending, uh, protecting against climate change? Oh, that is such a great question. Uh, Landscape Ontario, which is a whole amount of gardeners, landscapers, and what have you, are uh, really interested in Southern Ontario citizens planting um, deserts or, 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 or plants that don't require as much water as say the grass lawns that we currently love. So absolutely planting zero fights or those that don't require as much water, really, really important. They photosynthesize, so they absolutely are 
but they do not require huge amounts of water in order to grow really, really vigorously. And so you're going to start to see uh, certainly a lot of communities such as Guelph, which is just uh, to the west of Toronto, you're starting to see citizens planting these really, they look a little bit odd at the beginning. They have all these kind of cactus-like plants mm -hmm. and all these uh, really neat stones. But yeah, these kinds of gardens are really, really important. This whole idea of having these beautiful lawns came from watching Hollywood movie stars in the 1950s who had their beautiful lawns and they require huge amounts of water for irrigation and whatever. And we, growing up in the 60s and 70s, wanted those beautiful lawns as well. They're not sustainable. They use too much water. Perfect. <laughs> oh, Hollywood. So, if, so, so basically what you're saying, if we could get Hollywood to show more images of... Yeah, you know, okay. I okay. have to say, if I could get to the Cardassians mm -hmm. and have them start to plant water-conserving plants, if I could have them start to show that the rain barrel that they collected water in is now flushing their toilets, I'd be eternally grateful to Hollywood. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time here. Let me see if there's any well, one last question I could just sneak in, if you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Okay, so this one is about, oh, about glaciers. So ah. this, the question is, because of glaciers, um, Sir, because glaciers are melting due to global warming, what would happen to the ocean currents if they mixed with the fresh water? Oh, that is such a great question and has already started to happen. And I am going to go totally out of my depth, but it is enough to actually change longshore currents such as the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream came up from the tropics and mid-Atlantic uh, would go over to, say, the island of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, and actually help to moderate the climate so that even though the UK is in a northern latitude, it didn't get the snows, for example, of, say, Ontario. With that melting ice cap then, it's been able to actually affect change with regards to ocean currents. So it's already started happening. That's about as far as I'll go outside my <laughs> total lack of knowledge, but absolutely. Not only is it ocean levels rising and ocean acidification, but those melting ice caps make huge other ocean current changes that we're already starting to see the impacts that climatologists and oceanographers are working frantically to figure out uh, what to do. Okay. Perfect. Oh, all right. That, that was amazing. <laughs> so all of you experts who are listening who are horrified by my expertise in outer space and <laughs> oceans you can just write to me <laughs> <laughs> uh, th th thank you for for, for 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 doing your best in answering those questions i, I really <laughs> i as well as everyone on, on, on the online here i'm sure we all we, we all appreciate it very much so with that uh dr mccarthy thank you so much for taking time out of your, of your busy day to to do this with us to educate all of us um uh, for everyone in the chat, if we haven't gotten to your question, we will be tracking those questions we haven't gotten to and try to get a response to you uh, with our next newsletter. So I apologize for that. But I just want to thank everyone for joining us here today. And we want to thank uh, Dr. McCarthy here for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everyone. <laughs>